Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is going to be part two of the NUMI review, but let's start off with some charts here. The first one here is one I've looked at a number of times. This is the Dow Transportation Average and the WTI crude contract. So if we go in closer, we can see that the WTI is starting to roll over. You can see that there. Uh, the MACD is rolling over and the price is rolling over. It looks like it's getting ready to go into new lows. That is so extreme. When you think about how divergent these are, this is the weekly and this is the monthly. You can see how insane that divergence is. The transportation is, is sitting at a price of $148 uh, equivalent barrel per oil, whereas the uh, oil price is sitting at the equivalent of 3750 transports. So that's indicating that either the oil price is going to double from here or the transports are going to get cut in half. Um, I just don't see how things can continue on this way. Um, something is, is really crazy is going on. Now we're going to go and look at the currency of or actually what's going on in Belarus but before we do that we want to look at what's going on with the Russian ruble now there was a article by uh, on the dollar vigilante Jeff Berwick's publication about how this is actually in Russia's interest what they're doing here but you can see the very large recovery in the value of the ruble although it's backed off some because it was all the way down to 50 to 1 to the dollar and now it's back up to 54 but nowhere near where it was are we going to get another leg up we could you can see that the MACD is completely reset now so we're definitely in uncharted territories but let's look at a response here from Belarus as opposed to what Russia has done this is the president of Belarus he tells retailers, money grabbers, and thieves that capital controls will remain forever. There's just so much win in the following article describing what is taking place in hyperinflation-ridden Belarus, a true Keynesian success story that we decided to post in its entirety. State control of prices in Belarus will remain forever. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko has said that state control over prices will remain in place in the Republic and urge businesses not to count on a liberalization of the price policy after the scraping of a package of emergency measures from the government and the National Bank. Anytime you have a politician saying something like that, then you can just about guarantee there is going to be a liberalization of the price policy. This can't continue. Quote, I was told and saw for myself that some of our scoundrel officials have been telling entrepreneurs, businessmen, and all sorts of thieves that they should wait until around January 9th or 15th and everything will be liberalized here and they would be able to get what they have not until now. People are simply begging to be, you know, where I want to say that the trend, as is fashionable to say nowadays, toward control over domestic prices will remain forever, Lukashenko said at a meeting which focused on the country's economic development on Friday. So there's a, a perfect example of a lunatic politician, a King Canute who thinks that he can command the tide. Of course, he'll go down in history as uh, a failed uh, insane lunatic. But let's look at the hyperinflation that's going on in Belarus. This is from the 22nd of December, again from Zero Hedge. Quote, we have to do something with these Belarusian rubles, exclaims one Belarusian as she shops to turn worthless rubles, a BYR, into physical assets. As AFP reports, the Belarusian currency was dragged down by a slide of the Russian ruble last week, leading authorities to impose draconian measures, forbid price increases even for imported goods, oh, that's bright, and warn people against panic. Now, however, in an effort to stem the flood of hyperinflating domestic prices, authorities have blocked online stores 
and news websites to stop the run on the banks and shops as people scramble to secure their savings. One of the blocked news websites noted, quote, it looks like the authorities want to turn light panic over the fall of the Belarusian ruble into a real one, calling the blockages December insanity. And so you can see there's the price of the ruble. There's the people lining up, trying to get their currency out of the Belarus bank before the currency becomes worthless. There's your empty store shelves. We see this story over and over and over again as the common people try to scramble as much as they possibly can to get something of value for their worthless currency as it just devalues into nothing. So that's what's going on in Belarus. It's the same story we've seen over and over again. We're going to see that story here. Now, obviously, piling into consumer electronics and whatever you can buy with your paper currency isn't going to be the best investment for your money. Obviously, you'd be much better off protecting yourself in the precious metals, and it's something that you would have had to have done ahead of time. So you can see here on the silver chart, we're still trying to form that bottom. We can see the MACD has now turned up. We crossed over 16 to about 16.30, and we're still trying to rally. Uh, we'll go ahead and pull up the volume so you can see we have that massive volume bottom still in there with the volume decreasing sharply. So we're still looking for the bottom to be put in here, but we could be wrong. Nevertheless, it's in your interest to try to accumulate something that central bankers can't devalue. And they can certainly devalue their paper currencies very quickly, as we saw with the Belarusian ruble. So let's get over and look at the Numi review for today. I've done two of them. I've done the wildlife series and the kookaburra series. Now this is the Canadian wildlife series and this series started out in 2011. It started out with the wolf and the grizzly. You can see they actually released two in each year. I've just done 2011 through 2013. So you can see in 2011 we got the wolf and the grizzly in 2012, we got the cougar and the moose. And in 2013, we got the bison and the antelope. So a, a fairly consistent trend here. You can see the drop off in price. We have an average eBay price of about 34 and a half bucks, whereas the store price is 41 bucks for the wolf. The grizzly is about 30 bucks on eBay. It's all the way down at 25 bucks on the stores. Now this this has come down significantly for both of these coins. I remember for the longest time that it was 60 bucks to get one of these Wolf series. And the the mintage on these is about a million for each coin. So that's going to be significantly higher than the mintage that we have on the Kookaburra series. That one is about 300,000 per one ounce coin, then that was raised to about 500,000 in the last few years. So what are the patterns that we see? Well, the first pattern is, of course, the, the falling prices. The one exception is going to be the moose is cheaper than the bison. Um, but again, as I pointed out, the, the wolf and the grizzly are coming down. Uh, you can see that Someone actually got a grizzly for $21. Here's $26, $26. For the longest time, I thought that this coin was just going to follow the wolf up. And it's turned out that it's gone the other way, that the, the wolf has followed the grizzly down. And the prices are not sustaining, especially for a coin that is three years old. Now, why is that? Well, one of the biggest reasons I can think of is the spots, the milk spots issue. And the milk spots have been a tremendous problem for the Canadian Mint. And that has applied to their Maple Leaf series every year and this wildlife series and some of the other off coins that they've done. Why do they have the milk spots? I'm not sure. My guess is 
that that it has to do with the fact that they're four nines at the Canadian Mint, and that's probably just too uh, too much silver. Um, we know that the the coinage that was used in the United States is 90% silver and about 10% copper. Maybe it's copper zinc mix, but uh, you can't use pure silver as coinage. It just wears away too fast. So we have coins that are anywhere from 90 to 95 to 99 to 99.99 percent silver. So my guess is that the Canadian mint went too far with the purity and that's probably in my guesstimate what's causing the milk spot. So we have that milk spot issue. The other thing you have with the Canadian series, and I've only bought, um, I think the ones I have are the 2010 uh, Maple Leaf Olympic anniversary ones. Uh, not the guy with the hockey player one on it. I wish I would have bought those, but it has a, a, a picture of a Canadian Maple Leaf and then an Olympic symbol. I think they were 2010s. That's the only ones I've bought. When I got those, they came in these strange white yellow tubes of 25 coins. Of course, you take them out, they clang together. So that's another reason why I don't prefer the Canadian coins. Now, I did do a research. I was going to do the Maple Leaf series and just do the Canadian Mint on this video. But the Maple Leaf series just didn't really even show anything except for the ones I've pointed out. The anniversary one and the hockey player one and the other uh, Olympic Memorial one. Other than that, the Canadian Maple Leaf performs even worse than the Silver Eagle. There's just really no premiums in the back years. You just, you just don't see a numismatic premium to them. So overall, I, I would have to say that I'm, I'm very glad that I've avoided the Canadian Wildlife Series for the most part. Certainly people who bought the Wolf Series and got good unspotted coins are in good shape. But over to the Kookaburra Series, this one is exactly the opposite. This was absolutely shocking and surprising to me. You can see I did it back to 2007. Now these go way, way, way back. And uh, I think the earliest one I saw was 1992. These, this series has been around for a long time. Now there was a controversy with the mint filling up an allotment afterwards. And I remember seeing a bunch of the 2001s and 1991s coming online. And then I don't know what the final word is on it, but some of the members have told me that the Perth Mint has come out and assured people it's not going to go back and redo these. But uh, as I said, these these kookaburras have uh, a 300,000 allotment to, I believe it was starting in 2011, they went to a 500,000 allotment. So if you look at the prices here, you've got some real outliers. The first outlier is going to be the store price for the 2008 Kookaburra, you can see it's all the way at $150. You've got the 2009 at $80 and then $53 for the 2010. We don't even get down to the 20s until we're in 2013, 2014. Now the eBay, it somewhat confirms those, but not nearly as high a prices. So you can see that for 2007, we have an average of 34.5. We have an average all the way up at 60 for the 2008. And you can see those prices were all across the board, all the way from 80 bucks a coin down to 48. So that was a real crazy one. And these were all filled into their allotment, as far as I know, up to that 300,000 for the one ounce. Now, you have to also remember that there was kind of a, a change in look during this 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, and 2012 period. If you look at the 2013, 2014, and then all the ones before those four, they kind of look similar, just a kind of a natural wildlife look. But they experimented with some real interesting looks in these four years here. 
and those seem to be ones that have kind of a premium on them. So you can see here we've got an average price of 34.5, 60, 41, 36.5, 35.5, 32, 30.5, and 26.5 for the 2014s. So the Kookaburra series has done very, very well. I'm sure that a lot of it has to do with the very, very low allotment. Uh, the 300,000 is one third of what the the maple, uh, I'm sorry, the, the wildlife series were. And then the 500,000 is, is half of that. So it's a very low allotment if you think about how many coins are out there. Now I didn't cover the privies and uh, the privies are generally more expensive. I'll probably do a special covering the exceptional coins and the privies and things like that. But just to conclude, generally the Kookaburra series is much more successful than I thought it would have been. Uh, we bought 2010s, we bought 2011s. Unfortunately, we didn't get 2009s, 2008s. That would have been a fantastic deal. Now, as I mentioned in the last numismatic special, you always have to keep in mind the average price of silver during that year. So for 2007, the average price of silver was very low. Same thing with 2008 as it fell from 21 down to 850. Uh, then in 2009, we started to get that rise. 2010, we took off starting in December, and then it was 2011 when we got that peak. So clearly, if these 2011 coins were purchased between, let's say, March and May, then, then some of these are at a loss. But you can see that that price there is up there at 41. That's pretty much the average for those high months there. So it doesn't look like a lot of people are willing to part with those coins for less than they bought them for. That's the strong hand sort of thing. And that's one of the reasons why I recommend looking at these Perth numismatics and some of the other numismatics because they seem to get into strong hands and the people who have them aren't willing to sell them at a loss. Uh, there are some people who are apparently dealers and people who are trying to flip the coins for a quick profit, but generally the ones that were up high, they just, they don't come down. So I'm really impressed with the performance of the Kookaburra series. You can see it's not cheap. The 2014 is $27 right now. That's more than $10 above spot. So these aren't cheap to pick up. Uh, maybe if you could pick up some of these $48 2008 Kookaburros, it would be worth your while. As you can see, they're selling in the store for as high as $150. But pretty much it looks like the train has left the station on these. So going forward, I, I looked at the 2015. It's still relatively cheap, but uh, I don't really like the pattern on that one. So I'm not really sure, but at least based on past price performance, the Kookaburra has been a very successful coin series. So back to the silver chart, it looks like a bottom is formed. We have to remember that at any point in time, even though the dollar is extremely strong and has been for the last few months, that something like what has happened in Belarus, something like what has happened in Venezuela, something like what has happened in Argentina, this sort of thing can come up at any time. And it it's not going to be a situation where you want to run out and strip the shelves of the store of the latest consumer electronics. That's not going to be a way to preserve your wealth. The way to preserve your wealth in those coming storms is to be stacking silver the whole time leading up to it and be ready when it comes. And we'll talk to you next time.